Good afternoon, everyone. It is indeed a great um, privilege to be standing here in front of you and um, delivering a um, lecture in a, this agriculture and development seminar series by Sierra and John C. Delta from the Society of Agriculture, both of which I am a member. And um, as a former Sierra scholar, um, this is my way of giving back to the first institution that supported my um, early career as researcher. So this afternoon, I will be um, presenting to you my dissertation. This is um, the work that I did in, um, my, in the graduate school. The research was done um, from July 2009 to October 2010. So it, this is a work, uh, this is the result of hard work, lots of tears and perspiration. The title of um, my presentation, as you can see on the board, is um, A Filipino Transnational Advocacy Network, The Case of the U.S. Basis Cleanup Campaign in the Philippines and the United States. I have um, designed a presentation and um, subdivided the, the topics into seven um, smaller ones. First, I'll um, give you the abstract so that you'll have a first idea of the presentation. You'll see, uh, I'll give you the take-home points that I want you to get from the presentation. Then I'll answer this um, question, what is TAN or what is Transnational Advocacy Network? Then I'll narrate to you the story of the case study from the time that it emerged as a local um, campaign to the time that it transformed as a transnational advocacy network to the time that it was played with, um, with controversies and uh, was ripped apart and um, to its decline. And then finally, we will look at where it is now at this point, um, which is a campaign in abeyance. And finally, I'll give you some points on where do we move on? Where do I move on? And I would like to, you to join me in thinking and thinking this moving forward after the dissertation. All right. So this research analyzes the nature and the processes that have been undergone by a local campaign that was done, that was initiated in the Philippines and was done transform into a transnational advocacy network, right? And by looking at, by, by using this um, case study, the main object, my main objective was actually to unearth concepts and themes so that I can help in um, the, the building of knowledge on this type of social action by non-state actors. What are non-state actors? Non-state are, actors are those um, organizations or any entity that are not using the means and mechanisms of the state or are not attached to government agencies. Examples are um, civil society organizations, non-government organizations, both local and international, um, multinational corporations, um, media, media conglomerates they can be considered as non-state actors. And um, the, the diaspora communities, migrant communities that are scattered across the, the, the globe, and the epistemic communities. The epistemic communities are technical people, scientific organizations that provide advice, advices to, say, the government or other, enti or other entities that would be their help or assistance. So, the, this um, dissertation was my contribution to the knowledge building in analyzing the social action by non-state actors. That's my elevator synthesis of the dissertation. Okay. So let me um, Okay. Let me um, do that for you. So in this dissertation, my focus was the deep experiences of the partner organizations in the transnational advocacy network. We will look at their experiences. This is a qualitative um, case study research, and so we look at the contextualization of these experiences. Okay, four main take-home points that I would like you to get from this research. Number one, I argue.
argue that the campaign that had happened, the, the, the toxic cleanup campaign, was an offshoot of an enduring social movement against the U.S. bases in particular and U.S. you know interventionist policies in the Philippines. So this is an offshoot. This is a, the result of that enduring social movement against the United States um, military bases. Second. I, are, I, I theorize, actually I will be theorizing, I will be proposing a theory in the, the later um, section of the presentation. I theorize that the relationship of these partner organizations in the transnational advocacy network, given time and space, will evolve from mere information sharing to a more engaged collaboration. Right? depending on the dimensions that are at work during the, the, the processes undergone by the transnational advocacy network. In the case study, I look into the legal aspect, the legal dimension, the ethical dimension, as well as the ethnic dimension of the relationships. Third, this intricate relationships among partner organizations in the transnational advocacy network as well as the social milieu in which these particular processes are being done can create wedges of misunderstanding and distrust that can lead to the premature decline of the network. But there will be problems. In the case study, the problems were lack of accountability. There, there was this um, um, this interest in the in the campaign, right, and other factors that I will unveil later. And finally, following the decline, various organizations outside the network can actually absorb the former partner organizations while they are continuously doing small pieces of work until such time that the former campaign will be large enough to for relaunch, right? So while it is invisible at this present, there are key activists that are working to revive the campaign. And that is called a movement in abeyance, right? So those are the four points that I would like you to take from this presentation. In conclusion, the better resource, we know this by heart, the better resource partner has a greater success in moving forward after the decline. By reinventing itself, by maintaining its vision, and restructuring its organizational um, setup. The key is they are better resource. And these resources, we know, can be monetary and non -monetary. And the lesser resource partners resort to being absorbed by NGOs that can provide for their welfare for, for the meantime. That they are gathering um, new followers, new members to revive the company. Right. So that's the entire presentation. Okay. What is that? What is Transnational Advocacy Network? Who among you have heard this for the first time? All right. And who has already heard this um, chart one? Okay. So Transnational Advocacy Network is a, um, an old, not an old concept, but it has been there, especially in the field of political science and social, um, um, political sociology. So what is make basically a transnational advocacy network? You know, sociologists are fond of making jargons, and one of the, this is one of those wonderfully sounding um, jargon. So this is just a, a loose, informal configuration of non-state actors. You already know what is what are non-state actors. So this is just a a uh, right? A, an assemblage of these non-state actors. Ken Enzigate, which I, who are the, um, one of the pioneer um, theorists on transnational advocacy network, define this more um, detailed. Okay, first, 
they, um, the Transnational Advocacy Network is a group of actors that are bound together by shared values. Right? They, they um, have the same desire to do something, whatever that something is. And they exchange information and services. Right? And they articulate a common discourse. Right? They have the same mindset, the same mind frame even if they are from across borders. So Margaret Keck and um, Kathleen C. King wrote this um, seminal book on activists across borders. And that is basically what they would like to propose, that activists can actually join one another in a campaign or in an advocacy by forging networks among themselves and sharing information. The catch is, according to K. Graham, is a political scientist, is that the main activity for transnational advocacy networks should be just to share information. Right? But on Facebook. But that's a network, that's a social network. Right? But in this transnational advocacy network, because you're not advocating for something, except if you're a Facebook member and you advocated for, you know, Farm bill to have a Philippine flag as their as its decoration. That is an advocacy, you know, and it's a profound ad advocacy. People laugh at it, but from a sociological perspective, that is a good advocacy. You know, putting forward a nationalist identity. And um, so, according to Kegram, the main activity of transnational advocacy network is to share information, and it should not be involved in a sustained mobilization and um, coalition building, right, at the local or national um, level. So the main activity is to share information. So um, let's look at the case, if this is what had happened. All right, so Ken Insi King, I will introduce to you Ken Insi King. They propose in their book, Activists Across Borders, a, um, an explanation or an approach to understand further transnational advocacy network. So this is a um, not complicated drawing, but this is just a simple concept. So they call it the boomerang pattern. So what if state A, what if the NGOs within state A have something to say or have demands? And um, state A blocks the you know the, this the request coming from the NGO. What if they block it? What happened? So Kevin Sikin said that the NGOs within state A will seek networks with other NGOs by sharing information you know, within that network so that the NGOs outside state A will pressure their own state, their own government through their linkage, you know, like intergovernmental um, organization to pressure state A into giving up in to the demands of the NGOs. Or if state B is uh, perceived as a superpower like the United States, they can actually directly pressure state A into giving in to the demands of the NGO. So the state A will open up its blockades and, you know, at least give some consolation to the NGO. Not because they recognize the legitimacy of the claims of the NGO, but because they, um, but because of the pressure of the state B. So you know, bakit siya boomerang pattern? Where's the boomerang pattern? The boomerang pattern is this. The NGOs put forward information outside the borders, hoping that it will come back with the pressure from the outside states. So it's boomerang because it comes back. The information is like a boomerang and the pattern is, is the idea is for the, that information plus the network that it creates will come back to um, put pressure on state right. right. So now that we have laid down the theoretical foundation of the paper, let's look at the details of 
the case. Uh, dito story ang atay dito. Alright. The dissertation was 293 and I cannot, you know, whatever I do, I cannot put all the details into the story. So I, I'll just um, highlight and then if you have questions, you can ask um, them later. Alright. Okay. So the case study, the storyline of the case study is a simple storyline. Actually, it's a linear storyline. It's a simple storyline, but it has complicated characters and very, very complex um, circumstances. All right. So the story goes like this. There's a look. Once upon a time, there's a local. Uh, there are lo there were local um, activists who who um, noticed some problems in a locality. And um, they would like to, to put forth the, um, the health concerns of people. And so um, they created a small campaign to help people who are afflicted by, by um, toxic contamination. As they were doing their advocacy, media, mass media um, started noticing them. And there are other factors such as, you know, their, their original NGO did not want them to pursue the environmental aspect of their activism because for that local NGO, it was just a distraction from their left-leaning advocacy, right? So instead of giving, caving in to the demands of the leadership, this small group of activists went from local to national and then their advocacy was picked by them, the national media and later on by international media. And so from a small local campaign in Mabalak at Pampanga, these activists were able to mobilize a transnational advocacy network through the help of former um, partnerships with other NGOs, mass media, etc. So it became a transnational advocacy network involving Filipino activists in the Philippines and Filipino Americans and American um, activists in the United States. All right. But then there came the problem. In terms of leadership, who is the best person to lead the group? How um, to allocate um, pera? Right? So, yung mga ganun problema ang um, dumako, nagkasakit yung organization, and then they could not come up with the best solution, and so it declined. And then right now, it is in abeyance. Alright, so yun lang ang story niya. Alright? But mas maganda yung mga nititig, yung mga details. Dun, that's where we learn these concepts and theorize, you know, new 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 um, explanations, etc., etc. So let's look at those um, details. All right. So just like what I said, my argument is that the emergence of this campaign was an offshoot of the social movement that came before before the campaign against the U.S. Um, interventionist interventions in the Philippines. And this campaign emerged as out of these relationships of colonization, so it dated way, way back, the social movement dated, dated way, way back, 1898, when we were in America, etc., etc. And um, up to the time that they finally adopted this victimization frame to, put, to bring forth the claims of the victims of the toxic contamination exposure in Clark Air Base. Right? So, balikan natin yung ano, the, our colonial past. According to Renato Constantino, which is one of those renowned um, historians we have in the Philippines, the Filipino people, I have, not, I did not cut this because this is a wonderful uh, quote, the Filipino people have had the misfortune of being liberated four times during their entire history. First came the Spaniards who liberated them from the enslavement of the devil. That's why we are a Christian um, nation. Next came the Americans who liberated them from the Spanish oppression. Then the Japanese who liberated them from the American imperialism. Then the Americans again who liberated them from the Japanese fascists. After every liberation, they found their country occupied by foreign benefactors. The people 
This is an its ruler, although it struggled um, so to change certain objective conditions, it had its most profound effect on the people themselves, particularly the culture and the social psychological identity among the Philippines. We know that by heart, right? But Renato Constantino was able to capture that, you know, history in a paragraph. Okay, let's look at American occupation. So we all know that by 1898, U.S. acquired the Philippines from Spain by paying $20 million to uh, via the Treaty of Paris. All right. And by 1902, despite some of the uh, um, protests from other American legislators, the Organic Act of 1902 was passed, wherein the U.S. was able to claim full sovereignty over the Philippine Islands. But this time, you have to remember, the Philippines was never a state of the United States. We are just unincorporated territory. What does it mean? It means that during that time, Filipinos can, could go back and forth between Philippines and the United States without getting visas. But as an incorporated territory, the Philippines did not have the full benefits, privileges, and rights of an American citizen. All right? And this arrangement has had a very profound effect on those Filipinos in the United States. But that's another story, right? They have a long history of racial discrimination against the Filipinos. They could not put Filipinos, whether they are Asian or they are Americans. And so, you know, that always created a lot of conflicts between the Filipino or uh, the, Philippine, uh, the, the Americans of Filipino lineage versus the white Americans. And then by 1947, after long years of, of negotiations, the military based agreement was signed. But here, when, um, according to some historians, even the most pro American Filipinos, they noticed that the US gave tougher terms on the Philippine MBA than Japan. And remember, that's 1947, that is the time when, you know, the World War II has just ended. And the Philippines was a long time ally while, the, while Japan was a former enemy. And this discrepancy in terms of the MBA conditions had a lasting impact on how the, the, the U.S. responded or not responded to the claims of um, to the claims of the campaign. In, in fact, the United States cleaned up their bases in Europe, Italy, Germany, just one click. Even in um, Japan, you know, there were issues of noise, some pollution. They were able to respond to that immediately. Even in Vietnam. They clean up some of the messes that they created, but not in the Philippines. Nothing. No. Right? They would not clean up. Because of this, there's some um, tough terms given to the Philippines in the military basis. Then came this tragedy called Mount So 1991. I don't know if you, the, the young girls, have a recollection of what happened in 1991. The, 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 there was this violent um, eruption by Mount Pinatu that burned the entire Clark Air Base you know, with asphalt, rendering all the facilities unoperational. It was declared in one of those um, reports by the military to, to the U.S. Congress that by the time, I mean, two days into the eruption, the, the Clark Air Base is non functional and the United States should not invest in coming and cleaning those facilities. But their eye was on the Subic base. They wanted the Subic base back, or the naval base back. They did not want Clark. Clark sits on a premier agricultural land, around 136,000 acres, while Subic is around 36,000 acres. In you know, pre another premier land with coves and beaches. They want those. 
they didn't want the car carries because in two days into that, the facilities were very first thing and non-functional. So the U.S. groups just evacuated that out of um, Clark uh, Air Base and then um, leaving behind this huge facility for Philippine government to occupy. That's when the problem came in because they would argue that, hey, you already used it even before we terminated the contract or you terminated our contract. All right, so the Philippine government utilized the Clark Air Base as temporary shelter for for the evacuees, you know, from the towns and um, provinces around the area, and it was estimated to be 350 people or about 20,000 families. They leave them. They, they live in the at that facility for you know, in a part of the time. Like, the more resource, the better resource people live there for say a week or two months, and those very poor um, people live there for five years. So, iba iba yung exposure nila to sa contamination. Right? This is Clark after pinatuloy. No, you know, you can't just do it. All right, another um, yo. So on their way out, the U.S. troops forgot a lot of things. They forgot to clean up their mess. They forgot to tell the Philippine government where are the toxic, uh, toxic barrel, barrels, barrels of toxic um, chemicals. They did not tell us. So the government put the evacuees on top of a motor pool. Kasi nandun yung barracks, nandun yung, yung mga living, some living quarters, some buildings that can be used as living quarters for for the, the these people. Right. So how did this contamination uncover? So the Igbabis did not have enough um, resources. They depended on rations for food and water. So the government dug up wells in the water pool. Right? So imagine there were barrels of chemicals, maybe they had leaked already to the, to the um, soil and water table, and then you dug it up, and then you accelerate the leakage, etc., etc. So the government dug up these wells, and then the, the people using the water, they noticed right away the different smell and texture in the water. Some of them, just to quote, they look, they are saw water which is rusty, which is rusty and muddy, all smelly and oily, putrid and easily spoiled. Even after long hours of boiling. So ganun yung iniinom na they boil it, pero iniinom pa rin nila, minsan pinapadeli nila sa bata, Pangit na nagatas, pangpaligo, panglaba, pangbilis ng bahay, pangluluto. Right? They use this water. And then in no time, they started um, noticing the high rate of miscarriage among pregnant women, high rate of um, deformities among babies conceived and born you know, in that cup home. Alright? So this is about that. Um, between 1991 to 1997. So there were these incidents. Okay. So what are the toxins that were found in the in the base? Most of all of these um, toxins were considered as per persistent organic pollutants, right? Like the PCBs. The PCBs are chemicals that are used for transformers. Right? And when you're exposed to it, you have a, you know, um, magkakaroon ka ng dermatitis. De deforming, der ano ha? Ayun, nag-change yung inyong mga, mga, yung skin, yung kakarashes, etc., etc. Yung benzene naman ay ginagamit sa, as basic petrochemical um, element, especially for food oil. Pag naman na, na langhap nyo yun, magkakaroon. It is carcinogen, it is your. Right. So, and you, it are, these are some of the chemicals that were found when there were research that were done in the area that, you know, like to which this, these communities have been exposed. 
Okay, so just some pictures in the internet. So, Dinkle is the inheritors of the U.S. military toxic legacy. Mike Rose Pabanan, five years old. Sheila Pineda, three years old. Aliara Mercado, five years old. Priscilla Pabustan, three years old. Abraham Tarot, four years old. Kevin Nate Piring, seven years old. Priscilla Jane Valencia, six years old. They are already dead, except for Abraham. All right. And Priscilla Valencia was used by the campaign as a um, rainbow warrior. She yung if you Google um, toxic base a uh, basis in the campaign in the Philippines, you lagi ang lalabas yung mukha niya. Kasi um, she was used by the, the green peas, you know, to give face to the toxic contamination by the people's task force. You know, she, she they used her pictures to give faces to the to the victims. All right. So let's look at how this um, this particular campaign was able to transform into a transnational advocacy network. Right. Let's look at the different um, partner organizations of the campaign. So we have the People's Task Force for Basis Cleanup. This is composed of the local core activists who were once members of the Central Luzon Alliance for um, Sovereign Philippines. And they would, they really wanted to have a um, an environment um, focus on the campaign of the Sovereign Philippines. But the leadership in the Sovereign Philippines did not want it because you know, during that time, even the the left the left leaning activists would not want to indulge with environmental issues because they think number one, it was these are just fat, all right. Number two, they are distractions from the what they do. You know, the, their activism against U.S. bases, distractions from all right. And they look at it as a middle class issue. Okay, so in People's Task Force, nagbuo siya because the Central Luzon Alliance for Sovereign Philippines would not want to have it in their organization. So what they did through the leadership of the, the uh, a woman warrior, she uprooted five to six of, the, of her um, followers and they went to Manila. So from Luzon, uh, Central Luzon, Mabalakat, Pampanga, they went straight to Manila and they hooked with the Nuclear Free Philippines Coalition. And they became one of the desk, campaign desks of the Nuclear Free Philippines Coalition. Then the campaign became humongous, right? it became huge. And so the nuclear free Philippines, again, not wanting to be distracted by the environmental concerns versus their own um, agenda, they suggested to these four activists to make it uh, a separate NGO, and thus the birth of the People's Task Force for Basis Pina. And then once it um, was organized, there were different organizations, there were different individuals, they carried their organizations to them, one of which is the Greenpeace um, International, right, which became a very um, good ally by the People's Task Force for Basis Cleanup. And then there came the experts from the United States, um, and they called themselves as the U.S. Working Group. So, ito yung mga Filipino-Americans and American um, medical doctors and what is, ay, ba yung mga expert? chemistry, ma chemists and um, soil pathologists. So, they went to the Philippines, they had a tour and to investigate the, the toxic contamination in the U.S. basins. And uh, when they went back to the U.S., they organized the Filipino-American Coalition for Environmental Solidarity, which was the basic um, organization that supported the campaign of, of PPFCBC in the United States. Okay, so 
This is how it is. From a third world sea to the Badabdab Resettlement Center, which is one of those resettlement areas that houses the uh, that house the um, the former evacuees from uh, Pinatubo eruption. To the first world city, this is uh, San Francisco, California, where the office of the Filipino American Coalition for Environmental Solidarity can be found. And these are one of those. Um, these are the these the activities, former activities that they had. Okay. So, makikita niyo may may connection na nangyari because of three key strategies. First. They transformed, the PTFBC transformed itself from local to national. They solicited the technical expertise from the U.S., especially the, the Filipino-Americans. And finally, they built a network. Okay? And this is transnationalism as strategy. We have to blur the socio-political geographic divide among, among the activists. There has to be beyond borders and across borders, all right? And through this um, transnationalism, through time, the TAN can move past the information sharing and actually participate in a more engaged collaboration. Number one, by reaching out to the community of victims. They provided basic services to the to the victims from household needs to diapers ng mga bata, milk, etc., etc. Then they organized this community so that they would be more involved and that their um, approaches will be more um, participatory. And through this, there was deepening of relationship, not just between PTFBC and FACES, but between PTFBC and the local community and faces and the local community. Alright. So do nag evolve, ganun nag evolve yung transnational advocacy network between PTFBC and faces. Alright, so remember the boomerang pattern. Yan yun, yung original King and Seeking um, framework. My question is what if State B also put on blockage? What happened? What if hindi lang yung Pilipinas ang may blockings? Kasi hindi nila pinapansin yung campaign. What if yung US actually blocked the, the campaign? What happened to the network? Right. This is the, my, the theory of engaged collaboration. So, you have NGO A, which is PTFBC in this case study, and NGO B, which is FACES. Both are working to pressure and persuade their respective state to respond to the problem so that, you know, through information sharing and networking, they would be able, they would be able to pressure state A, the Philippines in this case, state B, the U.S., in forming bilateral cooperation that would look into and solve and take responsibility over the contamination in the military bases. That's the ideal scenario. But what if these two states both block the campaign? So my, my um, proposal was that the NGO A and B goes to the grassroots, which is a no-no, right? -no, K. Graham said that the main purpose was for transnational advocacy networks to just to share information and never indulge itself with mass organization. But local community is not mass organization, all right? These are just community victims of the of the toxic contamination exposure. The bottom line is that NGO A has to make sure that NGO B will have a, an, a close really working relationship with the local community so that their advocacy is just no longer just um, focused on the state but rather their advocacy would include 
the daily workings in the community, the daily needs of these um, victims. Because these are the people that they use in their advocacy. These are the people that they use in... These are the people who use, whose pictures they use in their information sharing. Diba? Imagine kung dyan lang, yan lang ang advocacy network, yan lang, yan lang. Paano yung local community? Siya yung pinukunan mo ng information. Whose lives you use in your advocacy? You, whose lives you use as topic for your paper? Whose lives you use as topic for your consultancy? Right? Okay. This, this is just a theory of explanation, alright? And I would need some scholars, new scholars, to join me in testing this and looking at, you know, other case studies that, that have gone through this process of engaged collaboration. Nag-succeed ba sila? Yun ang gusto kong tanigin. Kasi in this case, hindi ko masasabing successful or hindi. Alright? Basta yun ang aking explanation. So my theor theorizing is that given time and space, the nature of relationship of this partner organization will evolve from mere info sharing to more engaged collaboration. Meaning to have deeper um, relationship with the local community or whoever that they are representing in their network. Alright? And in the case study, there were three prominent dimensions of this engaged collaboration. Number one, technical and legal. The U.S. Working Group provided for, for policy on education, research, and development, as well as some mechanism to file lawsuits against the Philippine and the U.S. government. Yes, they filed sila ng lawsuit. Now they filed sila ng case against the government. And this is through the help of the technical people who, uh, who became their allies. Then there was this um, dimension of the ethical dimension. All right. This covers the uh, moral and affective aspect of the campaign. Using the cases of the victims actually solidified the campaign. Nung nagkaroon na ng mukha, di ba kanina nung nagpipresent ako, I was just talking to you about this net network, para Facebook yan. But then when you, you saw the faces of these kids, these this children, nagkaroon ng feeling, there's this moral question, alright? Of what is the right thing to do beyond what it has been said by the law. Or in this case, the military basis of it. Alright, then there's the ethnic dimension. Alright, this ethnic dimension captures the, the, the sharing of common identity between the Filipino activists and the Filipino-American activists through the use of the Filipino nationalist identity. Without the ethnic dimension, this particular Filipino transnational advocacy network could have not gone through you know, many trials. Kaya na, the Filipino-Americans, instead of identifying with their Amer the American side of their national identity, they tended to, they opted to, um, to identify with the Philippine identity, right? That's the reason why they became more engaged with the network. All right, but then, why do seemingly successful times decline? What are the factors that lead to their business? All right, all right, here. There was a rift. Like, away away yung mga partner organizations. Sabi natin because of money, because of um, yung hati acts of authority and power, leadership, management, magkaiba sila ng, ng pananaw, magkaiba yung management paradigms nila. Pangalawa, there was the dismissal of the cases filed against the Philippines and the U.S. And this demoralize the members of the network, especially the victims. They did, they did not know what to do. They thought it was over with the dismissal of these cases. Why was the Philippine case dismissed? Kasi sabi ng, ng 
regional trial court sa ating sa Pampanga yan in ano sa amin ang city ay hindi kumuha yung PTMBC na permit from the the Philippine government to be sued kasi dapat technically merong yung Philippine government hindi siya dapat sino sue but if you want to sue it you have to get permission from the Philippine government to be sued all right that's a that's a law and then why was some um, the US um, the US lawsuit was dismissed? Kasi by the time that the, the, the case was filed, wala na yung American sa basis. The US basis were no longer US territories. And then this demoralized the communities as well as the warring factions of the um, partner organizations. Then there was this lack of sustained community support in the U.S. They could not get the critical mass number of people that can sustain the campaign. Nandun na lang siya. Although, no, at first, marami sila pinuntahan yung um, as far as Ann Arbor, um, Michigan. You know, imagine from from the West Coast to the East Coast. Yun, nakarating sila to campaign. But then, eventually, the, the 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 support for the campaign was just within San Francisco, which is the home of the most prominent radical Filipino activists. And then finally, the 9/11 incident. At the height of their campaign, there came 9/11, 2001, and the the mood and the atmosphere in the United States would not even permit questioning the military and their activities. And this had, you know, a very, you know, radical impact on the campaign. The real, right? Again, it's having to a crisis in leadership, fighting out uh, the lawsuit, and then eventually being dismissed. Even the whole community, nag reflect na rin yung awayan within the organization. Divided loyalties, infighting, sino must victimize. Sino ang mas distorted ang katawan na bata? Sino ang mas dapat nabibigyan ng maraming um, assistant? Eh yan, tingnan mo naman, nakakalakad. Nakakapagsalita. Yung anak ko, nasa wheelchair. Yung anak ko, deform ang katawan. Yung anak ko, ganito. So, nag-aaway-aaway sila. Sino ang pinaka mas dapat bibigyan ng pera? And finally, as reflection to this riff, nag nagkaroon na rin ang falling apart ang Philippine activists and the because the Filipino American activists would not want to do anything about the problems in the Philippines when it, when, when it came to money matters. Because they don't want to talk about it. Okay, so what happened? There was a premature de-radicalization. What is uh, okay, another jargon? Ayan, the two jargon that I've given you. Transnational Advocacy Network and premature de-radicalization. What is premature de-radicalization? Sabi ni Thacker, the de radicalization is coming to terms with the existing order. You na kiki pagbati ka na tut sa dapat na pinoprotesta mo. Okay? Yun ang simple explanation. So nyare, dapat radical ka makilaba at makibaka, tapos kinabukasan, nasasabi na na de radicalized na yung yuman mo, kapag nakiki pag um, negotiate ka na, tut sa dapat ay ano nilalaba na mo. Yun ang de radicalization. Okay, for me, there was a premature de-radicalization of the campaign. Kasi yung revolutionary vision ng campaign, which is, you know, based on the belief that people's power can actually influence the workings of the state. Yun ang aking revo yun ang revolutionary vision ng, ng campaign. Ang nangyari, nagura lahat yan. When they started, when they missed, number one, they, when they missed the opportunity with with the Visiting Forces Agreement. Who knows about Visiting Forces Agreement? Because during that time, there, was, there were negotiations between Philippine and U.S. government. Hindi nila yung na-capture, na-miss nila yung opportunity to pressure the Philippines into demanding from the U.S. Pep, 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 bago kayo, bago tayong pumasok sa another negotiation, dinisin nyo muna ang palat. Dapat gano'n, di ba? Strong Philippine Republic. But, you know, PPMPC was so into the, the quarrels within it that it missed that opportunity. Next, I they pursued the institutional avenue. 
Ano yung institutional avenue? They file the cases. Imagine niyo yung nalang basis kung bakit na-dismiss. Kasi hindi ka umingi ng permit. That's working with the existing order. It's premature because hindi pa sila nakaka-achieve ng goals nila, ginawa na nila yun. Nakipag-work with the existing order. And they file these cases. So, when, when these cases were dismissed, naglaho yung elan, naglaho yung spirit, naglaho yung soul of the campaign. That it was like, oh, wala na. Na-demoralize, na-demobilize yung campaign. Okay, so this is what it is. It's a movement in abeyance. Is it successful or was it a failure? So, ito, ay, ito, sorry, three jargons. Abeyance structure. Mag maganda yan kasi you can keep this, especially for students. You can keep this concept. Abeyance structures are those organizations that absorb or retain activists between waves of mobilization. Ibig sabihin ng waves of mobilization. At the height, tapos di ba may babagsak? Between that, those height, those peaks, ano nangyayari dun sa mga activists, you know, during the low, of the campaign. So, yung mga organization na yan, yun yung mga umaabsorb sa activists na to. Imagine, kunyari, um, ano nangyari sa mga UPLB activists ngayong wala na sila sa UPLB? O, di ba, inaabsorb sila ng gobyerno? Magiging ipliyari sila ng gobyerno? Or iaabsorb sila ng bayan? Di ba, those are organizations that they can absorb that they can absorb the former UPLB activists. Ganun din dito. Saan na pupunta yung mga activists na nawalan na ng campaign? Oh. Yung mga nag absorb na organization, they are called abeyance structures. Alright? Good word, di ba? Four routes. First, yung mga, the first route is they return to their previous affiliations. Second route, they move forward with new organizations. They change affiliation, they move forward with other NGOs. Third, they renew that they, they are trying to renew the campaign. And then lastly, redefining the mission. Okay, tinan natin ngayon kung sino sino yun. So, sa round one, you have Greenpeace, those people who used to work with Greenpeace during the campaign, they, went just, they just went back to Greenpeace and became the head of it, or maybe staff, important person. Even for nuclear free Philippines, may UP um, faculty tayo who used to be like a board member of this campaign. After the campaign, we went back to teaching in UP Manila and you know, still the, the spokesperson or somebody up, up there you know, in the nuclear free Philippines. Some of them are, you know, konsihal, magiyan, kumabalik lang sila doon. Okay lang, maganda, ayos ang problema. Patuloy ang buhay. Next! Yung iba naman, pumunta na sa ibang mga international organizations. We have the Global South, Healthcare Without Harm, yan, mga sa Manila, yan, if you want to work with them. And some of those Filipino-American activists, they just um, organized another new um, entity, which is Philippine Scholars. Ito yung nagbibigay talaga ng scholars directly to families with special kids. Alright, so that's a good advocacy. Third ay yung ginagawa ng mga core, yung mga matitigas na ulo ng activists that went from local to national to international, sila din ang natira. They still are working for the campaign by forging relationship with another organization. Ngayon ay yung Bayanian Foundation Worldwide. Alright? And lastly, yung faces, kasi mayaman nga sila, marami sila pera, nire-configure lang nila yung sarili nila. Right? Madali lang yan kasi sa Amerika naman sila, hindi sila masyadong grounded sa Pilipinas. Ito na ang PPRGC. They um, are now, uh, the, the, the members are now under the wings of Bionian Foundation Worldwide. But still continuing with the campaign. How about the faces? Ito naman ang faces. They, they found new partners in the Philippines, yung mga organizations who are active with Pandakan, Oil Depot, you know that issue? Alright, so dapat alam niyo yun, di ba? And um, in the United States, they uh, work against the Chevron, you know, one of those largest oil companies. Right? And they took on, they, um, not, they did not abandon, they would not tell me that, but they set aside the basis campaign first, and then they moved with 
the environmental justice movement, which is very much American. Alright? Kasi, na, di ba sabi ko sa inyo, before nag-identify sila sa Filipino identity nila, now they are more American. Alright. Future research, let's look at the political role of tags. Alright? Ano ano yung impact niya sa political process, lobbying of, of uh, politicians, hanggang sa mga uh, iba-iba pang activities that would disrupt our uh, political processes. Let's look at comparative research of tags. Especially those initiated in developing countries like the Philippines. Alright? Let us look at um, ethnic based stance. Yung mga may Filipino, tulad ng Philippine American Coalition, you can identify the nationalist um, stance. Alright? And then let's look at tax in abeyance. Yung mga napipending na trabaho. Alright? So, kung interesado kayo, I would, I mean, I would want to talk to you so we can have this this particular um, okay, relevance to science communities. Scientists are also transnational and state actors. Right? Kahit na medyo, medyo sanitize yung environment, yeah, still, you know, that particular the, the scientists and technical people can actually be activists. And um, let's look at how they can contribute. Of course, they can contribute as non-state actors especially in advocacy network. Remember the, the U.S. working group. Without them, the, the, the campaign would have had a 